Hey, what's up? So glad that you've joined us for Church on the Move Broken Arrow online. My name's Ethan. I'm one of the pastors at COTM VA, and we love coming to you weekly with this online version of church, especially for those of you that aren't able to gather with us in person, maybe you missed for some reason, uh, or you're just not in a position where you can be with us. Maybe you're from out of town. Maybe you're not even in Tulsa. We're thrilled that you're here. In fact, uh, this expression of church, I think, is one of the ways that we're able to stay connected, uh, even on the go in a, in a busy life. So we're thrilled that you're here. Let me get one thing out of the way right away. Uh, I'm gonna get questions about this. This is a bunny logo with, uh, it's not a skull and crossbones, that's a bunny with the skull and crossbones, which is kind of like uh, the mullet of logos. It's a little bit serious and a little bit fun. So that's just me in a nutshell, but we're glad that you're here. And because we're in a teaching series called uh, Why Church? So that's the question that we're asking and answering during this season, why? Church, and here's why we're doing that. During this season, we're evaluating, and maybe you could say it this way, we're reevaluating just about everything. Our commitments, uh, the nature of our priorities, what's important, what's not important, what should stay in our lives as we move into this new world, and, and what needs to go. And what role does church play in that? We've answered that question a couple of different ways, and here's kind of the big idea. You probably have already figured this out at this point in your life. God did not build you, design you, create you to do life alone. He created you to have a community of people around you that make you better and help us follow God more closely. And one of the ways that the church does that is by being a truth-telling community. I think now more than ever, we need a place and a group of people that help us understand and elevate the truth. We're super divided as a culture. In fact, it feels like there's an argument over just about everything, uh, socially, economically, politically. And the church is called to be a place where we seek the truth and we speak the truth. In fact, it makes us so much better that God goes out of his way. In fact, this is what uh, Ephesians chapter four says, about speaking the truth. This is from the Amplified Version. I love what verse 15 says from Ephesians chapter four. Talking about you and me, the church as a family, it says this, rather let our lives lovingly express truth. Rather than what? Well, the first part of Ephesians unpacks a lot of ways that we might get being a family wrong. Maybe ways that we treat each other wrong. Maybe ways that we don't exactly have each other's back all the time. Uh, but Verse 15 says, instead of all that, let our lives lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. Enfolded in love, let us grow up in every way and in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. This is the idea, maybe you've heard a version of the Bible that says, speak the truth in love. The idea of the church as a family that speaks the truth is that it's a safe place for truth. See, truth sometimes is hard to take. Sometimes it's hard to be challenged by the truth. Sometimes it's embarrassing, right? A simple example of that would be if, you're, if you've ever had a piece of broccoli in your teeth and, and your friend says, hey, you've got something in your teeth. It's like a little embarrassing. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that was in like my teeth the whole time I was having this conversation with people. But the truth, even when it's a little bit embarrassing, always helps us be better. This is why the church should be a place of truth, but truth without love can be really abrasive and harsh. So the church is called to be a safe place to tell the truth. And so I want to give you just quickly three ways that the church speaks the truth. The first one is this, we speak the truth about Jesus. See, Jesus and the way that we understand Jesus and the truth about Jesus really is the foundation for how we share truth about everything else in our lives. This is what Jesus said with, uh, he went on a kind of a field trip with his disciples in Matthew chapter 15. And, uh, and then in verse 16, it kind of unpacks, or in chapter 16, he kind of unpacks why he took them where he took them. And so this is what uh, Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13 says. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, you need to know Caesarea Philippi is not just the name of some place over in Israel. It's important that it's in there because Caesarea Philippi would be a weird place 
for a Jewish rabbi or a Jewish teacher to take his disciples. This was not the place that good Jewish people went. See, Caesarea Philippi was a place where there was a lot of uh, just evil things happening, a lot of pagan things happening. There was a temple there to a God named Pan. And at that temple, there were some really awful things that happened with human trafficking and human sacrifice, just absolutely horrible things. But yet this is where Jesus chooses to take his disciples to teach them a very important aspect of following him. This is what he says. He gets there and they're looking at this temple, probably looking out at this whole region. He says this. He says, who do people say that the son of man is? Talking about himself, kind of pointing to himself. says, what's the word on the street about me? This is what they say. The disciples said, well, well some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Did you, did you pick up on what they were saying? He said, some say, and others say, and, and, and still others say. In other words, there's a lot of opinions. And I think what was true then is still true now. There's a lot of opinions about Jesus. Who is he? What role does he play in my life? What does it have to do with me? And how does it inform the way that I see life and live life? This is what Jesus is getting at, because here's what he knows. What you do with me will dictate what you do with the rest of your life. See, as a follower of Jesus, it's not just a theological or doctrinal understanding about who Jesus is, but it is a life-shaping truth. What do you believe about Jesus? So then Jesus turns the conversation a little more personal. He says, okay, there's a lot of opinions about me, but then he turns to his disciples and he says, but what do you say about me? And this is what Peter says in answer to that in verse 16. It says, Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And the word Messiah is a loaded word in Jewish culture. It means all of this, everything else, literally, from the beginning until this statement of Peter, everything here was written. The law, the prophets, the poetry, the books of Kings, uh, all of the history, everything written was written to point people to a day when God would make all things new by sending his Messiah, his anointed one, the answer to the problem of God being separated from people. And, G and Jesus in this moment is asking, who do you say? And Peter turns and he says, you're the answer to all of this. Everything that's here, you're the one that we've been waiting for. This is what our hearts have been longing for. You're the one. Now for us, that seems like Christianity 101, right? Like, you know, Jesus is Lord is a bumper sticker, right? It's a t-shirt, it's a billboard. But in this moment, Peter was saying, you being here changes everything. My entire story is changed because you showed up in my life. And look at how Jesus responds. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this, this idea that I'm the Messiah was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Then he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Jesus looks at Peter and he says, what you just said is not a person's idea that they came up with in their head. This wasn't something that you just thought of. This wasn't something that you read in a book. This wasn't something you saw on a video, but heaven unlocked your heart and you could see me for who I really am. And in all of the noise and all of the debate and all the things that people were saying about Jesus, Peter had a different understanding of who Jesus was, not because of what they said, but because of what he knew from heaven in his heart. See, there's a moment with Jesus that every single person that would say they met the real Jesus would describe to you something like this. Man, there, there was always something in my heart that was kind of missing and I was living my own life and then I met Jesus and everything changed and I couldn't explain it all to you and I couldn't tell you every, couldn't tell you exactly how I knew, but I just knew God is real and Jesus is Lord. He died for my sins and he was raised to new life and I'm putting my faith in him and it changes everything about my story. They would say exactly what Peter said. Jesus is what my heart has been waiting for my entire life. Everything up until now was waiting for Jesus. And in a moment, 
I understand who he really is and it changes everything. The way the Bible describes this is like a light going on in your heart. In fact, in the beginning of John's story, when he's telling us about Jesus, he said the world was dark and when Jesus stepped into the world, light dawned on people who were living in the dark. In fact, a lot of the prophecies about Jesus talk about Jesus like a light. It's how I would describe the moment that I would say I met the real Jesus. It's like a light going on. And in a world of competing ideas and people trying to make sense of life, it is very much like being in the dark. In fact, I brought this lamp from the other room. Here's, here's how it works. And you, you, you know this, you probably experienced this last night or you'll experience it tonight. Uh, you're in a dark room, uh, the, the sun has gone down, everything is dark and you're turning out the, the lights for the night or maybe you're getting up in the morning and you're, you're fumbling around and it's early and you're trying to, trying to make your way through a room. Well, what, what, what do you know about that room? I know there's things in this room. I know there's things that I'm probably going to run into if I don't have some light. So what do we do? We do what any smart human being would do, uh, unless you're stubborn like I am sometimes at two o'clock in the morning. I, when I think I can navigate this room without turning on any lights, what do you do? You turn on a light. Why? It's a really simple idea, but the light makes sense of what I know is there. I just can't navigate it without something showing me exactly how it all works. Well, this moment with Jesus is the first moment in our life when the light goes on. And what starts to happen? Man, it starts to reveal things. It starts to show things in our lives. This happened for me when I was 17 years old. Now I grew up in a Christian home and I, I knew God. I got, I, you would say I got saved or I gave my heart to Jesus when I was five years old. And I remember that moment. And you could not have talked me out of believing that God was real. I, man, I knew God was real. But here's what happened. As I grew up, uh, I, I drifted away from my relationship with God, especially in my teenage years. I grew up in a wonderful family, amazing parents, but their relationship as a couple started to struggle. And as amazing as they were, their marriage eventually dissolved because they were just having a very difficult time staying together. Maybe you've experienced that in your life. But for me as a, as a teenager, it was really difficult to navigate how my parents had raised me to follow Jesus and what I was seeing in them now. It didn't add up, it didn't match up perfectly. And so I just started to walk away from God. God did not have a real place in my life. Here's what happened for me. I would say that the world got pretty dark. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just kind of doing whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted to do it. And one day, I wasn't in church a whole lot during that season. And, and one day I was, I was dating a girl uh, who wanted to go to church. So she's like, let's, let's go to church. There were, some of our friends were going to this church service. So we went to uh, a, a church service. And as we went to that church service, we sat uh, in the back because I was I was kind of uncomfortable being in church and maybe you've experienced that maybe that's where you are now I can totally relate I just wanted to have a baseball hat pulled down over my eyes I didn't want to make eye contact with anybody because I knew in my heart I was not right with God and I didn't want anything to do with this but she was there so I was there and during that church service there was a guy that came to speak his name is Dave Reaver and if you don't know who he is uh, he was a Vietnam veteran who was really horrifically wounded when a phosphorus grenade blew up in his hand and it scarred him. But through that experience of finding new life and faith in Christ, even in the middle of suffering, he had an incredible testimony and a really incredible ministry to students. He would do massive school assemblies. And so as he was preaching to the church that night, he said, all, all the high school students, if you're in here and you're in high school, I want you to come down here to the front and I want you to sit around the stage on the floor because I want to talk to you. And I remember thinking, not on your life, Buster. I am not getting out of my seat. I'm not walking up there and I'm not sitting crisscross applesauce style on the floor like a five-year-old kid. There is no way I'm doing that. But to my surprise, the girl that I was with, just she obeyed. She got up and she walked down front. And some of the friends that I was with were guys and they went down there with her. So here was the thought that went through my head. I'm not, I know one of those guys likes her and I'm not letting him have this like Jesus moment with her without me. So I'm gonna go down there and I'm gonna sit on this stupid aisle with her because I don't want her to be alone. So I walked down there and I sat down, you know, legs folded, legs crossed, and I'm sitting there and I felt like a little kid. I felt stupid, honestly. It felt so uncomfortable. 
And I'm sitting there, and if you've ever been, if you've been in a, a church, right, what, like the aisle is right next to the chair. So they're like grownups sitting right next to me, just like staring at me. And I feel all the eyes of the world on me, and I'm so uncomfortable. But at one moment during his message, he walks to the edge of the stage, and he pointed his broken, scarred finger right at me. Now, he was probably pointing like at the whole group, but it just felt like in that moment he was talking right to me. And I just thought, why are you looking at me? Why are you talking to me? Go talk to somebody else. Don't talk to me. But in that moment, he looked at me and he said, you, he said, some of you may be running from Jesus, but Jesus will never run away from you. But then he said words that marked me for the rest of my life. You may not always have an opportunity where God can get a hold of your attention. And if you feel God working on your heart, don't run away from that. Pay attention to that. And as he's talking, it was like a light going on. And I could see all the places in my heart that I knew I had not been doing the right things. What is that? That's truth. The truth came into my life. And in this moment, I knew who Jesus was and I knew what place he should have in my life and I knew what I should do about it. And I'll never forget that moment, giving my heart to Christ, meeting the real Jesus and saying, I am all in to follow you. And in that moment, it didn't matter what my friends did. It didn't matter what my girlfriend did. It didn't matter what people thought of me. I would say this, that I had this light bulb moment, right? that changed everything about the trajectory of my life. And it's interesting that Jesus talks about this when he's talking to Peter, and this is what he says. He says, nobody on earth revealed that to you, but it was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. He uses this word revelation, this word revealed. And that word in the Greek is the word apocalypto or apocalypsis, and here's what's fascinating. Jesus literally says, Nothing on earth apocalypsed that to you. That was apocalypsed to you by my Father in heaven, which is, just sounds like a completely strange word to use. In fact, it's the same word used for the last book of the Bible. We call it the book of Revelation, right? But the, the, the Greek title for that book is the apocalypse or the revelation of John. Now, the reason that in a Western world, we use the word apocalypse to talk about the end of days like atomic bombs going off and zombies taking over or aliens attacking the world. The reason we use the word apocalypse is because it's the word revelation or the word apocalypse from the last book of the Bible. But think about what happens in the apocalypse or the revelation of John at the end of the Bible. Is it kind of crazy? Yes, but what happens? What's the overall theme of revelation? Is that what is old passes away and a new heaven and a new earth and a brand new bright God honoring future takes its place. In fact, you could say the theme verse of the entire book of Revelation is Revelation 2.15, which says, behold, I make all things new. So you see an apocalypse in the Bible is a moment of revelation that causes everything before it to pass away and something brand new to take its place. I would describe my real Jesus moment as an apocalypse. It's like a wrecking ball of truth that comes through and it tears everything down, but in its place, something beautiful and new and, and awesome can grow instead. And can I tell you that moment with Jesus that Peter had, the moment I had with Jesus, the moment many of you have had, and if you haven't, can I tell you it's the moment Jesus wants to have with you? That moment changes everything. It's why as a church, we will always speak the truth about who Jesus is over and over and over again. We will declare it over everything else in our lives. Why? Because it changes everything. But it's not only a moment in time we have with Jesus, it's also a pattern that we learn in following Jesus for the rest of our life. What does that mean? It means that in the same way there was darkness and truth came into my life. This truth about Jesus illuminates the dark and now I understand and I see things. Can I tell you this moment, this picture should happen over and over and over again in your life following Jesus. A moment where the truth penetrates the noise and you go, oh, 
oh, that's how God thinks about it. Oh, I get it. I see what I'm doing wrong. I see how I'm hurting myself. I see how I'm hurting other people. I see where I've had the wrong attitude. I've been in the dark, but now, now there's light. Now I can see clearly. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 17. He says, he's praying for his disciples. Also, by the way, he's praying for you and me. Here's what he prays. He says, sanctify them by your truth. What does sanctify mean? Sancti sanctify or sanctification is the lifelong process between now and heaven of learning to be more like Jesus, learning to think God's thoughts, learning to follow God's ways. And it's a lifelong process. You can think about salvation as a train. The engine of salvation is what we call justification. Now, these are just theological words that are placeholders for an idea. Justification is this moment with Jesus where I give my heart to Christ and I'm justified. It's just as if I never sinned. The blood of Jesus makes me brand new and I am saved, but that's not the end of the train. There's cars that follow the, the, the engine called sanctification. Those are lifelong moments of truth changing everything about us. And at the end, the caboose is what we call glorification, that one day when Jesus returns, there will be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new you and a new me. And all that's old passes away and something brand new takes its place. And so this moment that Peter has with Jesus is a pattern for how we speak the truth as a church. It starts with us speaking the truth about Jesus, but then we do the second thing, we speak the truth about culture. Culture is everything that's around you and me. In fact, there's all kinds of things that shape us. And culture, I don't know how your experience was maybe in church. For me growing up, I heard preachers talk all the time about Hollywood. Like, like we can't let Hollywood raise our kids. And I always thought, what does a town in California have to do with Jesus? I don't understand why we're always so mad at Hollywood. But here's, what, and, and, but, but here's what we're saying when we say that, and there's truth to it. There are ideas, sometimes with a very direct agenda, that are trying to change the way we think so it'll change the way we live. Your culture is made up of, you could say it this way, all of the inputs and all of the ideas that come into your eyes and your ears all day long. Social media, movies, music, the people that you're around, all of those things shape who you are. We call those things our culture. Now, you have several layers of culture around you, just like I do. We have a national culture. Inside of that national culture, the way we think about our nation and the world and the way that our country relates to the world, which by the way is different for every country depending on where you were born and where you grew up. Inside of that national culture, we have a local culture. It's the way that our school does things. It's the way our city does things. And local cultures are different even inside of our country here in America, right? We have uh, a West Coast culture, right? This is uh, probably a little more easygoing, like uh, blonde hair, sandals, a little more man, surfer dude, like let's just, and then, but the East Coast is a little different, right? A little more, a little busier, faster paced lifestyle, a little more business-like. The South is, man, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's home cooking and sweet tea that'll, you know, with so much sugar, it'll make the spoon stand up, right? That's what, what those are cultural things that are local. Inside of that local culture, you also have a family culture. How you grew up, what your parents valued, what your family said was important. And all of those things add up along with the things that you're inputting every single day to a culture. And here's, here's why this matters, is that the church has to be a group of people speaking truth to that culture speaking truth to the inputs that we have every single day. Now, here's, what I, here's what, what I would say to you. We are not at war with culture. We're not at war with Hollywood. We are not at war with a political party. We are at war with lies. The number one tool that the enemy of your soul uses to get you to think wrong so that you will live wrong is lies. In fact, Jesus says in John chapter eight, he says that, that Satan is the father of lies. Every time he speaks, he speaks lies. It says this, Jesus said, lying is his native language. He doesn't know how to do anything else. He doesn't, he doesn't even know how to speak the truth. He speaks lies, which means that every day, multiple times, maybe all day long, there are lies coming into your life. Lies about how you ought to think about yourself, about other people, 
Lies about what other people are saying about you, why you didn't get the promotion, why that didn't go your way, why you didn't get the breaks that you should have gotten, what other people are saying about you behind your back. Lies, lies, lies. All of these lies are coming to your life. But because they're coming in through culture and they're coming in in all these little inputs, it's almost impossible to see. The lies that we get, that we hear, that we receive are largely invisible and hard to spot. It's a little bit like drinking water. We have several examples uh, in our in our you know culture right now of um, drinking water affecting people's health. And health, in fact, that's happened recently in Michigan. My wife was born in Michigan, so we're kind of aware of the story uh, in the area of Michigan where the drinking water has been making people sick. If you remember the old Aaron Brockovich movie, this is this is the story, right? She has to go to court to prove that there's been something in the water that's making people sick. Why does she have to go to court? Why, why, don't we just, why don't we just look and go, oh my gosh, don't drink that. It's because the contaminants in the water are largely invisible. So what do we do with our water to make it healthy? We filter it, right? So this is, this is my drinking water filter here. And uh, inside this pitcher, some of you probably have this, it's just a pitcher, you pour the water in the top and then the, what comes out of the bottom is supposed to be good for you to drink. What, what, how does that work? Well, inside of it, there's this little filter. This filter, every time that water is going through this filter, it's catching. Now, this isn't very big compared to the amount of water that I drink, but it's because the contaminants aren't very big. They're invisible. Whatever's inside of this, you probably know better than I do, carbon and whatever else is in there. What does it do? It catches all the little impurities and all of the stuff that I would be taking in so that over time, that water makes me healthier and not sicker. You need this for your mind, your heart, and your soul. With all of the things that are coming into your life, you need some kind of filter that allows you to perceive the difference between the truth and the lies for the light bulb to go off and go, no, no, that one doesn't make it in my life because that's a lie. That one can't pass through the filter. The church, the people of God that you surround yourself with, your small group, your friends that you serve with at church, your family members and coworkers that are followers of Jesus, they are meant to be this kind of filter in your life. Can I tell you this? You're meant to be this kind of filter in the life of the people around you, for your kids, for your spouse, for your friends, your roommates, your, your coworkers, your teammates. You're meant to be a filter to get lies out of their life. When Jesus says, sanctify them, with your truth. What does he say? What does he say? What does he say? He says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. This is the filter that helps us understand what is true and what is not, what makes it in our life and what we cut out. The church is designed to be a place that teaches the truth in such a way that you can go, oh, I see where I've been allowing that lie to convince me to live or think or act a specific way way. So what lie do you need to filter out of your, I don't know what it is specifically for you. I would say probably all of us have a different lie that we've allowed to pass through our filter. And one of the best tests that you can put on your life to see whether or not you need to filter something out is this. Anywhere you've lost joy, anywhere in your life where you are losing joy or you've lost joy, you've believed a lie. If you've lost joy in your marriage and you just go, I, I just... I don't think there's any hope. You've, that's a lie. There's hope. You say, this, this job feels dead end. I don't know if there were ever, nobody ever, I don't know if the, the dream that God's put in my heart is gonna come to pass. I don't know if my kids will ever get over this, this, this phase that they're in, right? Can I just tell you, there is a hope. I have two boys that are now teenagers and I can tell you every time I felt like I didn't know what I was doing, Every time I remembered that God promises to honor parents that raise their kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, when I remember that truth over the lie that tells me I'm not doing a good enough job and I'm not making enough progress and maybe I haven't, listen, every time I do that, I find joy again. I go, okay, no, God's promised and he's going to be faithful. I remember one of the most vivid times for me growing up uh, of this playing out in my life. I was probably 12, 13 years old and I had a friend named Mike 
Mike and I grew up very similarly. Uh, both of us grew up in, in families that didn't have a lot of money. Uh, I, I, my dad had a pretty good job actually, but we had five kids in our family. And I think if you have five kids in your family, you're just automatically poor. Like you split drinks at McDonald's. That's just what we do. And so I remember growing up without a lot. And uh, Mike grew up the same way. And one day we were walking through a parking lot. As we walked through the parking lot, this beautiful uh, car pulled in. It was, a, it was a Jaguar and it pulled into the parking spot in front of us. And, and you know, we're both dudes, right? And we're teenagers and you just, I just loved cars. And so we stopped and this car pulls in. And I go, oh my gosh, that's a beautiful car. And as I said that, Mike, his countenance changed and he got sad. His shoulders sagged and his head dropped and his voice got really quiet. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I'll never have a car like that. And I just remember thinking, bro, you're 13. How, do you, how can you possibly know that the rest of your life is just gonna stink? How can you possibly know that, that you, you're not gonna uh, be able to make uh, you know, advancements and be successful in life? How do you possibly know that? And I remember in that moment seeing the difference between the filter that he had for truth in his life and the filter that I had. Now, thank God, I had a filter for truth in my life that told me that God's word applies to my life no matter what family I grew up in, no matter what home I was a part of, that God had good things. In fact, I wasn't planning on saying this, but look, 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 at, look at Proverbs chapter two. Proverbs chapter two is what came to my mind. Proverbs chapter two, there's a lot of debate and, and rightfully so over what place prosperity has inside of gospel teaching. And I think that the prosperity gospel has a lot of flaws to it. I do not think that there's gonna be a million dollars that shows up in your front, you know, on your front porch tomorrow morning if you just pray for it. I don't believe that. However, it is impossible for me to just read, for me to read this and just stop at God forgives me and saves me for eternity and has nothing good for me in this life. That's not the truth that I read as I read through the Bible. In fact, Proverbs chapter two says this, starting in verse one, it says, my son, if you accept my words and if you store up my commandments within you, turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. If you call out for insight, cry out loud for understanding, search for it as for hidden treasure, you will understand. And that's where a lot of people stop. Yes, absolutely. We should want to understand what God has to say. That's a good thing. But what, the, what, does, what does all of that do for my life? Seeking understanding, hunger and thirsting for righteousness. What does that produce in me? Look at verse seven. Proverbs 2, 7 says this. For he holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. He guards the course of the just. He protects the way of his faithful ones. This is what, it says God holds something in his hand for you. What does it say God holds? Success. Now, does that mean you're gonna be a gajillionaire? No, what it means is that in your sphere of life, you can be successful. You can move ahead. You can see good things happen for you and your family. This is the truth that filtered out that lie from a very young age for me that said, you're stuck in the family you're in. Whatever economy you, you grew up in, that's where you're stuck. Whatever situation you're in, if, if you're poor, you're poor. That's just the way it is. I knew better. Why? Because I was around a group of people that told me the truth. I didn't allow the cultural inputs and influences to change what I knew to be true. Can I tell you, there are a hundred, maybe a thousand different ways that those lies would try to shape how you think about you and how you think about God. And the beauty of the church is that we get, man, you get around people that honor God. You get around people that love Jesus. You get around people that have had that light bulb moment with Jesus. And there's just a different kind of faith. There's a different kind of boldness to attack problems and to not give up, to be tenacious, to not allow setbacks to be the final chapter in our story. Why? Because I refuse to believe those lies. And I don't know what your culture is. I don't know where your family story is right now. I don't know how old or young you are, maybe how final you feel some of your sin and some of your mistakes are. I don't know how devastating some of the things that you've walked through have been, but I can tell you this. 
God has better for you than you can possibly imagine. And we need to be around people that remind us of the truth. But the culture isn't just national and local and our family. You also have an, another kind of culture and it's your inner culture. It's your own voice and the way that you think about yourself. It's your self-esteem, your self-worth, your self-image. And that's why there's a third way that the church speaks truth. We speak truth also about ourselves. We speak truth about ourselves. What does that mean? Well, when we start to value truth and we start to seek for truth and we start to speak truth, what happens is that when you start to value truth, it starts to expose some things in your own heart. It starts to expose some places maybe where I've been fake and I haven't been fully authentic and really been honest about who I am. Maybe it means being honest about what you're dealing with and what you're struggling with. Sometimes we wanna cover that up and put on a good face and just be the happy Christian because Christianity should bring joy, so I should have lots of joy and not a lot of problems. But can I tell you, the world is still full of problems. We still need prayer. We still need people to walk alongside us and hold us up and agree with us and walk through difficult times with us. Speaking the truth about ourselves means that I'm bold enough to embrace the truth and what's really going on because I believe that God has real answers for real problems so I can be real. It also means that I have to be the number one preacher in my life. I have to be the one that looks at myself in the mirror and says, stop thinking that way. Knock it off. That's not what God's word says. That's not how you ought to be thinking. I had a vivid example of this when I was a really young leader. As a young leader, I remember uh, being in a, in a, like a kind of a, a leadership meeting at the church. And when I was first starting out, I think it's probably the way it is with all of us. I was the youngest person in the room. And these were all like older men and women that I really respected. And I remember there's a heated argument going on between two leaders during this meeting. And it got really uncomfortable. And I don't know if you've been in that situation where you're just like, this is, this is making everybody really uncomfortable and we should probably be having this conversation somewhere else. And right about the moment I thought maybe, you know, our, our, our lead pastor was just going to have to end the meeting and call it a, a truce between these two people. One of the guys, a leader that I really, really respect, and he was the one that was just agitated all meeting long. He was just upset, just agitated. It felt like nothing was good enough for him. And he was just mad at the world. He just stopped mid sentence. He said, guys, I am so sorry. And he kind of turned to himself and I never seen anybody do this before. He turned like to himself and he started talking to himself for a second in the meeting. He goes, you are just letting your flesh get the better of you. Knock it off. He goes, I'm sorry, guys. This isn't even about this. This isn't even about these things. I'm agitated. I'm having a bad day. I'm angry about some stuff and I'm taking it out on you. I am so sorry. What was he doing? He was speaking the truth to himself. And can I tell you, that the model of a church, the model of God's word, the model of people in your life speaking the truth to you should be an example that you apply to yourself as well, that you become the biggest truth teller in your life. That where you see places of inconsistency, you speak to yourself. This is what David did in the Psalms. You, you remember he says, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. What is he doing? He's preaching a sermon to himself. And can I tell you, go ahead and do it. It's one of the best things you can do. Preach to your own heart and you watch revival happen. You watch, you, you watch the scales kind of fall off your eyes. You watch your own heart be reminded of God's goodness. You watch your faith get wakened back up to go, yeah, you know what? God's good. Yeah, you know what? This isn't this isn't the end. You know what? I'm I'm not doing this right. And what happens? There's an apocalypse. The old way of thinking falls off. Something brand new and beautiful takes its place. And can I tell you, I over and over again as a pastor, this is why people will tell me, "Oh my gosh, I had this moment with Jesus and my wife and I were struggling." And she would tell you, "It's like there's a whole new guy that took my husband's place." What is that? That's truth changing us from the inside out. That apocalypse, that revelation, that light bulb moment where we go, I'm not that way anymore because I know the truth. So let me give you, as we close, four implications, or you could say it this way, four big ways that we speak truth. Number one is this, we don't let lies win. Don't let the lie be the primary headline of your life. Evaluate what you're thinking and listening to. Evaluate the narrative and the, the scripts that play in the back of your mind and decide in light of this, 
whether or not it's true or a lie. And if it's a lie, don't let lies win. Go to war against lies because God has better for you. Can I tell you, you're gonna have to go to war against lies in your family and with your kids. When you hear people around you speaking lies, confront it. Do it gently, do it in love, but tell them the truth. Say, hey, no, hold on. Listen, that's, you're, this is not the end. You're better than that. You, you don't have to give into that. You're not gonna be defined by this forever. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be mad. Speak truth to them because truth changes things. Number two is we don't hide who we really are. I mentioned that a moment ago, but we, we bring ourselves fully to the people that we love. For some of us, can I, just, can I just poke you a little bit? For some of us, this is gonna mean like telling the truth about some things you don't like and not just agreeing to everything. Christians aren't just people that get run over and we're doormats. It means that you can have an opinion. Some of us like our opinion too much and we might need to dial it back. Others of us need to actually share our opinion because we're just not being truthful. There's things in your life that you've allowed to be in your life that you hate but you've never been willing to tell anybody, I don't like this. Being a truth teller means we're willing to do that. Number three is we don't do passive aggressive. This means that Christians aren't manipulators. We don't try to manipulate behind the scenes things to work out our way. We don't, uh, uh, we don't gossip. We don't talk about people behind their back. We don't try to uh, you know, uh, use leverage. We don't pout to get people to pay attention to us, to get people to pacify us. We don't have an argument that hold it over people's heads. We speak the truth. We do, we're bold enough to put the truth out there and let the truth win and not be passive aggressive. Then the fourth thing is this, is we always speak the truth in love, always. That means that every bit of our truth telling should be wrapped in love. This is what Ephesians 4, 15 says. We started here, so let's end here. It says this. Rather than letting lies win, rather than this way of life, rather than all of that, rather, instead, or better than that, let our lives lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. If you'll allow the truth to be wrapped in love wrapped in wanting the best for other people. It's really what that means is that I'm not speaking the truth to be harsh or to get my way or to prove a point or to show where I'm right and you're wrong. I'm speaking the truth because I genuinely want better for you and I want better for me. When we allow that truth to be wrapped in love, it changes things. This is exactly what God did for us. He speaks the truth to us. He doesn't wanna leave us the way we were. He wants to change us. But when he comes to us, he doesn't come as a scolding father angry about what we've done. What is the Bible over and over again describes God as a mother hen who protects her babies, describes God as a refuge and a rock, describes God, one of the things that it says about God, you know, maybe you didn't know this, but it says that God sings over you. Do you know that? God, I don't know what he's singing about you right now. Maybe you're, you know, in your kitchen and you're cooking, he's singing about you cooking. He's singing about how great a cook you are. I don't know, he's singing some great song, better than what I could sing, but he's singing, why? Because he loves you. That's an expression of how much he loves you. So what does God do for you and me? He wraps the truth in love. And truth wrapped in love is a massive game changer. And it's the example that we're called to follow. So number one, identify where you need to live out the truth and listen to the truth more and then wrap it up in love. Do it because, not just because you wanna be right, but because you genuinely want the best for you and everybody that your life touches. The church is called to be a truth-telling community. When we are, we mirror a God that loves us that way. So I'd love to pray for you. And as I pray for you, here's what I'd love for you to do. Maybe you don't have that first light bulb moment with God. You wouldn't be able to say that there was a moment that Jesus was revealed to you and it changed everything. As I pray, I'd love for you to join me. And maybe today could be that moment for you. I'd love to be a part of that. Maybe you're just struggling to apply this to a particular part of your life. I'd love to pray over you that God would give you grace to apply truth in love. Lord, thank you for every one of our brothers and sisters that have joined us today. I pray that your grace would be sufficient for them, that you would give them grace for the places maybe they feel like they haven't measured up and the things they've done wrong. 
for everyone that's turning to you right now, God. Would you help them to say these words with their mouth? That they believe in you and they believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died and rose again so that they could have new life. And as they confess Jesus is Lord with their mouth, out of what they believe in their heart, we believe new life begins. We're so grateful for that. God, thank you for allowing each one of us to apply truth and love to where we are. And as we do that over the next day, couple days and weeks, God, would you just bring a supernatural uh, grace and, and backing to our efforts so that we would see your hand and we would experience your love and your new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.